America has a lot of nuclear warheads. And getting those warheads to where they need to be in a time of crisis is a task in and of itself. That's why you have the Minuteman Intercontinental Missile, large subs with enough nuclear missiles to send any country on Earth back to the Stone Age multiple times over, and the topic of today's video, the B-1B Lancer, more affectionately known as the Bone. The B-1 could go up to Mach 2 or get down low to the ground and get close to the enemy and set off its payloads to unleash mayhem on anyone that had the misfortune of being in its crosshairs. To do that in a time of war, you need to be on your toes, and that's why the USAF makes sure that all of its crews are trained and ready to go. On the 4th of October 2024, there was one such training mission underway. Two B-1s would make a felon flight, and they would take off from Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, enter the Power River test range, and then practice standoff weapon employment. Now, I had to learn what a standoff weapon was, so now you have to as well. Basically, a standoff weapon is a weapon, usually a missile, that can be fired from a distance so that the firing platform can stay out of the crosshairs of the enemy fire. With all the briefing and all of that out of the way, the two B-1Bs lit their afterburners and took off. Both B-1Bs successfully employed their simulated standoff weapons, and most of the training objectives had been met. But now they had a new problem brewing, the weather. In addition to that, the first B-1B was starting to run low on fuel. They needed to start heading back now. They considered diverting to Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma, but before they made any decisions, the flight lead decided to contact ground controllers for a weather update. As they got on the radio, the tower did not have good news for the crew. The visibility was down to 5 eighths of a statute mile, or 1 kilometer, or 3,300 feet. The two planes discussed, and they both agreed that they could make a visual approach to runway 13 with just half a statute mile of visibility. Once they were in contact with approach control, they requested the 1-3 approach as they had higher ceilings on that approach. With decisions made, the two planes split up as they both lined up for their respective landing attempts. RAPCON, a radar approach control, watched on as both jets locked onto the ILS and started cutting through the fog down to the runway. The controllers cleared both the jets in for an opposite direction approach. This meant that they would be landing in the opposite direction of other planes. They did this instead of switching the active runway at the airport. The two huge bombers were now spaced out by 7.71 nautical miles, and the first B-1B touched down without any issues. As it taxied in the fog, it was now up to the second B-1B to do the same. The aircraft commander of Felon 2 now had the speed at 164 knots and was on the glide slope. Then, in the final moments of the flight, the wind suddenly shifted from a heading of 340 to 190. Felon 2 had flown right into some severe wind shear. The plane sped up by 12 knots, and in the cockpit, the pilot pulled back power three times to keep the speed in check. The plane was still stuck in the fog, and the pilot searched for the runway, hoping that the lights of the runway would suddenly appear out of thin air, leading them down to safety. One of the pilots was looking at the instruments, and the other one was peering into the fog. The nose of the plane went up ever so slightly as the plane cut through the fog. Then the instructor pilot, out of nowhere, screamed, Climb! 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 They had somehow strayed away from the glide path, and now were mere seconds from slamming into the ground. The captain took a few seconds to light the engines. The four afterburning engines kicked in, and the pilots pulled back on the stick, a little bit too hard. The plane was now unrecoverable. The jet slammed into the ground just shy of the runway. The captain, knowing that things were going wrong, immediately pulled the ejection handle, and the burning wreck of the B-1B went onto the runway and rolled along the runway for 5,000 feet before coming to a stop east of the runway. In the tower, they knew that something had gone seriously wrong, and they were scrambling the emergency vehicles as fast as possible. In the commotion, the assistant director of operations got a text from the pilot of the plane saying that all was okay with the location to where they were. So, why did this happen? This was a $456 million jet that for all intents and purposes just fell out of the sky. The thing is, the reasons for this crash started way before this bomber ever got near the runway. Yeah, the weather was bad, but the thing is, there was a NOTAM or a notice to air missions out. For those of you that don't know, a NOTAM is like a bulletin that goes out to all pilots, letting them know of something important. Like bad weather, an inactive runway, that sort of thing. In this case, the NOTAM was titled M0766, 
and it had some very important information for the pilots. The notum basically said ALS inoperative, weather minimums were in effect. The ALS stands for Approach Lighting System. The notums basically said that, hey, the lights aren't working, don't make an approach to this runway if you don't have at least three quarters of a statute mile of visibility. Now, if you've been paying attention so far, you might see the problem here. The pilots of both B1s went for runway 13 because it had a half a statute mile of visibility. But this notum says that they should not have done that. What gives? As it turned out, neither crew looked over the notum. Quote, neither felon crew referenced the notum M0766, which stated that ALS and operative weather minimums were in effect, and therefore the minimum visibility required had increased from half a statute mile to three quarters of a statute mile for runway 13. End quote. They then got near the airport and then shockingly did not ask for a weather update. That begs the question, whose weather information were these pilots operating off of? Well, earlier on in the flight, the Fox 3, who is a person who has combined responsibilities of a supervisor of flying and an operations supervisor, told the crew that runway 13 had a higher ceiling. That's why they went with runway 13. They then didn't ask for any more weather information. If they had, then they would have known that the visibility was too bad to land on runway 13. With this huge blunder, the crew lined the bomber up with the runway. As they prepped for the landing, they did not do one very important thing. They did not set the radar altimeter. If they had, then when they hit the minimum descent altitude, they would have gotten a little light that said, you're at the minimum descent altitude. If you don't see the runway at this point, you go around, no questions asked. After this, the wind shear hit the plane, and the wind caused the plane to pick up some speed. In response, the pilot in command pulled back power on the engines, three times to be specific. But shockingly, the power was not added back when the winds died down. The engines remained at the reduced thrust setting. The pilot in his head thought that they were within three knots of their targeted approach speed of 164 knots, but that wasn't the case. The actual approach speed was 152 knots, well below where they needed to be. Due to this, the plane dropped like a stone. The plane got so slow that it was basically flirting with the stall speed. In the cockpit, the vertical velocity indication was starting to spike, letting them know that they were dropping. But they never had a pre-landing briefing, and the operators in the cockpit had no idea what the right VVI value would have been for a landing. So they did nothing. The cockpit voice recorder lacked any of the callouts that you would expect for a landing like this, particularly the continue callout when you see the runway. With that, the fate of this plane was sealed. The United States Air Force is the world's premier air force. How could one of America's best pilots make mistakes like these? The instructor pilot who flew on this mission had tons of experience with over 2,000 hours in the B-1 and several pilot upgrade certifications to his name. He should have known what he was doing. The mishap pilot, on the other hand, was more of a rookie with 257 flight hours under his belt. With this being the military, the investigators roped in the Department of Defense Human Factors Analysis and Classification Systems Methodology team, that's a mouthful, to see what went wrong in this flight. They found a lot, from not following procedures correctly, to a failure in visual scanning, to routing violations, and seriously, the list goes on for pages. This crash exposed a lot of things that went wrong with the bomber itself, but also the way the military operates. Quote, the inability of the MC to conduct effective cross-checks and utilize proper CRM, along with the 34th BS's lack of effective flying supervision, and the 28th OSS's failure to communicate airfield and weather capabilities and conditions, all speak to culture and leadership issues. After the board's extensive investigation, I conclude the human factors causing and contributing to the 4th January 2024 mishap were not an aberration. Instead, they reflected broader trends within the 34th BS and the 28th OSS. The 34th BS and the 28th OSS lacked proper supervision. The investigation uncovered unsatisfactory levels of basic airmanship and a lack of discipline in the 34th Bomb Squadron. Here are some deficiencies that they found from interviews. An improper understanding of cold weather altitude corrections, current landing restrictions, and many more. For example, the 34th Bomb Squadron commander 
said that he knew of the notum, but he was of the opinion that it, quote, probably does not play that big of a role, end quote. The 34th Bomb Squadron director was quoted as saying that this is not something that he fully understands. These are direct quotes. Moreover, the crews were not aware of the weather sensing capabilities of the airport that they were landing at, and they were not briefed on the NOTAM that day. The opinion part of this report is just scathing and frankly a tough read for anyone who wants to see the military at some sort of readiness should someone pick a fight. So, I'll leave you with this. Quote, The preponderance of the evidence revealed an ineffective and unhealthy culture, which directly contributed to the mishap, specifically the 34th BS's overall lack of discipline, inadequate focus on basic airmanship skills, and failure to properly identify and mitigate risk. Coupled with the 28th OSS ineffective communication, inadequate program management, and lack of supervisory oversight, set the conditions that allowed this mishap to occur by directly leading to the mishap's cause. End quote. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It'll really help the channel grow. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.